Hey, War Gamers, welcome back. Purple Druid presents War Game Culture. Today, we're going to talk about something a little bit different rather than the uh, fantasy mass combat. Today, we're going to look at campaign creation, and I'm going to talk about this book here. Hellfire Campaigns by Jim Webster, which I was turned on to by the Joy of Wargaming channel, uh, who used it in some of his chainmail games that he's been playing. And so I thought I'd take a peek. And I have to say that this book is gold. So right off the bat, I give this book five stars. Go out and get it. Uh, it is available on the uh, River site. You can order it from the... Uh, the uh, river site there and I believe it comes POD because I recall I got this pretty quickly so in any case one thing I do want to say is that this is for mainly for science fiction uh, six millimeter one three hundred scale gaming so I threw out some of my old 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 epic pieces there that I have rebased for future war commander which I haven't played in forever but reading this book has got me wanting to play. Um, however, if I do that, I will never get finished with my Civil War minis. So, so in any case, we're going to begin with what is probably the most amazing and astounding thing in this rule book right here. Uh, for solo gaming, you choose three options whenever you need to make a decision. You choose these three options in advance. So if you've got a situation uh, where an army commander needs to make a decision or you need to decide what one side will do in a certain situation, the, uh, the mechanic he, come up, he has come up with here is just amazing. Um, you roll a d6, on a one or a two, things get better. On a three or a four, things stay about the same. And on a five or six, things get more uh, messy and unpleasant. And I think that's just amazing. It works very well, I believe, with another mechanic that we have here uh, from the Solo Wargaming Guide by William Sylvester, which has a similar mechanic in that you write down three options for each of your campaign turns and then you roll a die for that. Hellfire Campaigns gives you a little bit more in terms of deciding how to weight those options. And he even recommends or suggests that you can add more to that if you want to make it a little more granular. It starts out with Map Your World. Um, most of your campaign books will do so. Bath and Sylvester start there too. However, the Hellfire Campaigns, uh, he recommends, uh, or his mechanic is to use playing cards, and this will determine not only the land masses on the planet that you're going to play on, but the geography of each land mass, as well as the population and um, the population density and what they do. So this is meant for a sci-fi campaign, and most of the rules um, discuss you know colonization and settlement. And he also describes that it's done in waves. I think this could easily be modified to describe intercontinental settlers rather than interplanetary ones. And basically, you throw down some cards that will determine where your land masses go on the planet. And then what you do is you'll throw down some more cards for each settled land mass to determine geographical areas political areas and cultural boundaries. So we'll do an actual demonstration of that. Uh, he goes on, um, again, you use the cards to determine tech levels. You determine the military formations of each state upon each landmass. And he also provides uh, for some costs and economic factors and other financial considerations for the states that are going, <clears throat> going to be involved in your planetary campaign. He goes into a little bit about peacetime versus wartime budget in that the wartime budget will frequently uh, throw the peacetime budget out the window. And uh, it's interesting because the annual income will vary due to population 
and how resource rich the area is. So I think it's pretty cool the way he sorts these out and definitely uh, it has, a, has a, a style of writing that is engaging and even a little humorous. Um, but when it comes to getting ready to actually set up the campaign, you've got your land masses laid out, you've got your geography determined, you know what um, populations are living where. What you'll do then is you'll assign each wave of settlement, and he recommends to use four waves, and you'll assign them a culture and a preferred form of government, and then you can lay out more cards to identify and rank the issues that affect each wave or nation or tribal group. Um, these are in uh, cultural issues, grudges, trade and finance, strategic issues, that sort of thing. So what he does is he gives you a handful of categories that you can use to determine why these particular uh, states would be in conflict and uh, what, what difficulties would lead them into battle. Uh, you use more cards to determine the political stability of each state. Uh, peace is an unusual state of affairs. Political instability points toward war. And that gives you a good opportunity to break out your figures and go to battle. So over the next 20 pages, basically from page 21 to 41. Oops. He goes over. How do we get a crisis? And he provides very detailed examples. And I'm just going to flip through this real quick. Um, of a campaign based on the example planet in the system. And how to determine what is happening month by month. And then week by week. And then day by day. There are some rules used in here that are mentioned in the actual Hellfire uh, miniatures game book and so uh, you kind of need both of those if you're going to play the actual game um, however you can easily adapt these comments and statistics to really any game system uh, and like I said the uh, this is literally priceless information um, you draw some cards you throw them down and then you interpret them very much a referee centric uh, activity and like I said it really inspires me to to break out these science fiction minis and uh, uh, I just I don't have time for that can't do that right not right now but anyway here's my Falcons again I'll let you look at those the uh, next section section two is called the man who would be king and this section is actually about setting up a regional scaled campaign of small thieves that buy against each other in the service of a single wealthy noble. And again, you use the cards. Um, he lays out a sequence of play in yearly, monthly, and weekly turns. And on page 43, he lays out two excellent tables for determining the type of ruler for each fief and the typical interactions they have with each other. So that way you can set up a dozen or so fiefs upon your map and then uh, determine what kind of ruler each one is. You give them a name you determine their population and their industry, and then uh, basically you just set them against each other, and you can run a solo campaign where each fief vies against the other, whether it's economically or militarily. Uh, like I said, the cards are used for generating information for the yearly turns, the fief income, and just how that revenue is to be distributed. He has broken it up into four categories, munificence, taking care of your people, magnificence, making yourself look good, the mogul, the noble in charge, and of course the military. Uh, the military budget and the archaic troops, uh, the rules for those are really, they're listed in the basic Hellfire rule booklet, but again, it's very simple to extrapolate these out and turn the second section into kind of a black powder campaign if you wanted to. Uh, the economics rules themselves probably bear looking into as these rules suggest some rather in-depth accounting and logistics. So if you're into spreadsheets, you can probably get just as granular as you want with this and uh, really get down into the nitty gritty of uh, dollars and cents. 
Uh, he also describes new troop types um, based on the Hellfire rules system. Uh, musket armed infantry, cavalry, rockets, cannons, and elephants. So it's a fantastic black powder genre as opposed to your more historic black powder genre. And in section three, he describes some new Hellfire races or cultures that you can base some armies upon. This, of course, is beyond the current scope of where I'm headed with my research. But uh, they're interesting in that one of them very much resembles the structure of a very famous spacefaring uh, marine <clears throat> game. So, in any case, let's get to the example of our map layout. And I'll clear these minis out of the way. And like I said, we use the cards. And he's determined uh, the suits have different aspects. Hearts, Rekka, um are for agricultural areas. Diamonds are for plains. Spades are for fertile hills. And then clubs are either hills for grazing or more rugged areas for mining. If you get a court card or a face card, that will indicate there's a city. And the uh, value, the numerical value of the card will determine the revenue available for that particular area. So what we'll do is we will begin by having this blank hex paper here set up. And then we're gonna throw down eight cards and that will determine the geography of our uh, of our landmass. So, just gonna throw these down, draw them off the top. I don't know if you can see the whole jewel in these, but these are uh, <laughs> casino cards. Oh, look at this! Wow, we got three cities in a row. Oops, was that seven? and eight all right so ten of clubs will give us hills for grazing or mining so either these are very uh hills that are very good for herds of animals or very good for mining i would say with a value of 10 they are probably rugged hills that have very very valuable uh, mineral deposits. Let's spread these out a little bit here. Let me get them all on camera. Sorry about that. The six of spades will indicate uh, fertile hills. Again, this is great for grazing and or growing crops, uh, vineyards, that sort of thing. The nine of hearts will be very, very valuable fertile agricultural land and the king of clubs will be a city again in the hills um, probably again we'll have mining um, we'll say that perhaps the northern area of this continent is mountainous queen of hearts again another city in the agricultural area queen and king right next to each other possibly a twin city situation or uh, perhaps even dueling city states and then a three of spades, fertile hills, and more fertile land off to the side. So we can see here, especially in this, uh, let's call this south and uh, east, there could be quite a bit of contention as you've got some very fertile land here in between the two different cities. So what we'll do now is I'm going to hit pause and we're just going to draw a quick sketch of what this landmass might look like. And then I'll be back to lay down the cultural cards. So here we are. I've sketched out a outline of the continent just loosely and then thrown down some symbols for mountains and hills. And I think we could do some fun things like we can add in a river flowing down. Uh, probably. So 
something like that. Maybe even another one over here flowing down out of the hills. Maybe another one going off this direction. That would give us our basic landforms and then also lay out the geography. So that'll determine the terrain that our folks get to get to uh, be on. So now we're going to throw down eight more cards in the same zones, and this will determine the cultural portion of the population and what type of person is living where. All right. So there's our eight cards. And the hearts are going to represent the first wave of interplanetary colonists. And I decided that these would be high-tech colonists with faster-than-light travel. They come from a post-scarcity mindset and are very egalitarian. So the hearts will have settled on the corners of the continent here, which... <clears throat> It's very interesting in that this has rich mining areas and this has rich fields. So perhaps when they landed, they were the first ones and they decided, hey, you know what? This is a great place to build the uh, post-scarcity society upon this new world. The second wave are the diamonds. And I decided that these would be medium technology colonists who arrived here via generation or cryo travel, uh, generation ships. Um, so they actually left the home world first, but arrived here second. Uh, so they're going to have a pre-apocalypse mindset, be very hierarchical and very disciplined. And that is also very awesome because that will set up uh, a nice conflict here uh, between those two. The spades, which will be here, um, will represent the uh, third wave. And again, these will be high-tech settlers uh, from the New Federation after the apocalypse. Uh, they have faster-than-light travel as well, and their expansion is from a post-scarcity society. But now they're looking for challenges. They're elite. They're the, <clears throat> they're the, uh, the aristocrats. Perhaps not the, that's not the right word. Um, more like the, uh, the commercial interests. They're looking to exploit these new worlds for the uh, new federation. And finally, in the clubs, which we have here and a city, that will be the fourth wave, which will again be high tech, but high tech as a matter of course. And I decided that these would be malcontents fleeing the new federation, um, smothering kind of cultural attitudes, and that these are religious fanatics. So here we go. In just a few minutes, we've been able to lay out the map, lay out the geography, and then throw down some cards showing where people are going to live. Now, having done this, this gives us an opportunity to sort of separate this area out and perhaps create some political boundaries. So the first wave group here will likely have a border so, and the first wave group in the northeast, I think their border will be a little more amorphous, probably just leading to the mountains there. And perhaps we'll do a dashed sort of line here, indicating a, a not, so, not so firm border between them and the third wave. So I believe there definitely will be a firm border. And let's say here, let's see. The diamonds are the second wave, so they would have gotten here first. So why don't we say that this group has claimed everything here from the hills uh, to the river, like so. And that will <clears throat> force these third waivers into that smaller space. Again, these third waivers here will likely have a border something along these lines. And again, they'll stretch across, 
across the continent. So <clears throat> now we have our borders, and all we have to do is start throwing down some more cards, and we can determine conflicts and so on. So there you have it. It's very simple. It's very fast, and it really is very thought-provoking as well. I'm very much looking forward to taking the Hellfire Campaigns book and pulling out some interesting mechanics and procedures and merging it with the Solo Wargaming Guide for the Imaginations campaign that we'll be running later on this year uh, after I finish painting the 15 millimeter. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. Have a great day. Hit like and subscribe. And uh, as always, if you have any questions, comments, go ahead and leave them below or hit up War Game Culture on Twitter. I'm more than happy to answer questions and certainly to engage in conversation if you've got ideas. So thanks again and have a great day.